I've recently been sharing this quote from David Jake's new book, The Design Thinking Classroom, and I really appreciate it. And a lot of this question is in the podcast you're about to listen to. And the quote from David Jake's is this, the fundamental question that all educators must ask is this, is what I'm doing helping students to be ready for their lives in the context of the future, not for a college, not for a job, but a, for a life worth living. And I so appreciated that quote. And I was thinking a lot about this in the conversation I just had with Jace McKenna. And it's a fascinating conversation. I really appreciated his insights and his thoughts. And one of the things that he talked about today, and it's something that I've really been focusing on, is the idea of what's next in education. And the reality of this is we don't know. And you don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. We can make guesses. We can think about different things. But really what is most important is... Do we prepare our kids and ourselves that no matter what comes our way, we'll be able to figure it out? And to actually have that ability, we have to have basic skills. We have to have basic understandings. And one of the things I've really been having and encouraging people to talk about in education is what are the basics in education? What are those things that we do today? So for example, in March of 2020, we had a bunch of people who could do cursive handwriting, but couldn't get on a Zoom call. So... I'm not saying what a basic is. I think the most important element of that is what are the basics? And for me, a basic that is true today was true 20 years ago and will be true 100 years from now is that we teach our kids and ourselves the ability to learn and adapt that no matter what comes our way, we'll be able to figure it out. And this theme came up over and over again with this fascinating conversation with Jason McKenna talking about his new book. And I know you're going to love it. I encourage you to subscribe on YouTube, write a comment. And really, what are some of your questions from this? What are some of the things that you want to learn from Jason? Because I've asked him to look at the comments and share in the ideas down below. Because one of the things that's really beautiful about our world today is that not only do we have the opportunity to read and find information, but we have the opportunity to connect with people, ask questions, really dig in deep so we can think about how this applies to our own context, our world. And so really love this conversation. I know you're going to love it too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm excited to have Jason McKenna on the podcast today. He actually has a new book out called What STEM Can Do for Your Classroom, Improving Student Problem Solving, Collaboration and Engagement. You can actually see the link to that down below in the description. Jason's been in education for 20 plus years. He still works with them, but he also now works with Vex Robotics, working yep. with students and educators all over the world. And we just did a podcast, had so many great stories that he shared from his experience, also from his book. And Jason, it's awesome to have you on the podcast. If you can just tell everyone a little bit about who you are, what you do today and how you got there, that's a great place to start. Yeah. And again, thank you for having me on. I've been admiring you and your work for a long time. It's really an honor to be here. But as you mentioned, I was a teacher for 20 years, a small school, about 40 minutes north of office here in Pittsburgh. And I taught fifth grade my first year. The years after that, I taught sixth grade. At about the year 12, 13 point, I needed a little bit of a change. I wanted to do something different. So as a result of that, our school, the enrichment position came open. And so I got that job. I got put in charge of basically the gifted program at my school. And I thought this was going to be the greatest thing ever. Kids were going to, I'm a history buff. I'm a humanities guy. Kids yeah. were going to want to learn about the Civil War. We were going to do like battle reenactments and all kind of cool, go on field trips, all cool stuff. None of my kids wanted to do that. Instead, they wanted to learn about computer science and robotics, of which I knew absolutely nothing about. The reason why that was is because because here in Pittsburgh, CMU used to run a summer right. program called CMITES, which is their summer outreach program. And the kids would take robots, they would code them and do a couple of things with them. And they wanted to do more of that. All these kids went to that camp and they want to do more of that in the classroom. And basically, I'm the type of person when I don't know what to do, I ask a ton of questions. And that's what I did. The people I asked questions to were this was the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Academy, which got started out of a research grant from NASA with CMU. Part of that research grant was to build the NASA Robotics Engineering Center. And they had to have an educational outreach part, which became the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Academy. I started working for them during the summers, just writing curriculum. The director was a gentleman named Robin Shoup, who's a former high school shop teacher in Pittsburgh Public Schools. He took a liking to me because I was a teacher and Robin was a teacher. And he was working with all these researchers 
and PhDs. He used to say to them all the time, you've never taught a middle school classroom. <laughs> so he said, Ace and I, we've been in middle school classrooms. You have not been in a middle school classroom. You have no idea what you're talking about. That's the attitude that Robin always had. So he took a liking to me. I left the classroom and started working for them. CMU started working for a spin-off company for them called Robomatter shortly there afterwards, which was then eventually purchased by Vex Robotics. Mm -hmm. And it's been really, it's been a, it's been a world whatever since. Vex is a worldwide company. So we have offices all over the world. So as part of this job, now I get to travel to places like Australia and all throughout Southeast Asia and South America and all throughout. And talk to teachers, talk about what their challenges are about implementing STEM, talk to them what their challenges are about doing things like project-based learning, assessment around project-based learning, how to structure it, how to do it. So it's, I have a great job and it's really a pleasure to be able to travel and talk to as many teachers as I do and see students in classrooms all over the world. So I remember actually in this, I don't know if this is going to make me look bad probably but i remember i actually went to speak in pittsburgh years ago and it was my first time being there and i and this is a kid from canada watch a lot of tv and a lot of shows i'm just expecting like steel mills yeah and, uh, yeah, yeah yeah and this is, this is ridiculous part of it i think like Derek zoolander his dad worked in pittsburgh and uh, do you know the movie zoolander yeah, right? yeah and like yeah. i'm pretty sure he's is from pittsburgh and whatever and it's yeah and when I got there, it like it is a hub of innovation. And mm -hmm. I it's really interesting because I, I actually didn't know that at all. And I remember I went to a Steelers game. Okay, and, of course. And you know, you gotta go to a Steelers game if you're <laughs> you're gonna have that. What's the sandwich called? What's For the sandwich? Me, yeah, yeah we won't talk about I, that sandwich. I love your sandwich, yeah. People love that sandwich, but they love it's, it. It's not good going out. I'm just I'll say it. I would recommend if you're coming to Pittsburgh, there's much better places to go to this. You gotta that. have it. Whether you like it or not, you got to have it. Just come to Pittsburgh, yeah. send me a message on Twitter. I'll tell you where to go. Yeah. All right. But I remember actually seeing like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is like this grinded out team. And like they, it's been because they're known as embodying the city, just mm -hmm. their attitude. I know I, I always try to work sports into everything I do in life, it seems. But I remember also looking out from that stadium and it is one of the most beautiful sceneries that you can see from a football stadium. And it's just this hub of innovation. And can you, is, do you think actually like living in Pittsburgh that has benefited some of the stuff that you're doing because you're so connected to other I, innovators in the area? I, absolutely. So it's the story of Pittsburgh, the revitalization of Pittsburgh, the story of a collaboration between research universities like CMU University of Pittsburgh, UPMC, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and then also industry like you were mentioning a moment ago. Carnegie Mellon Robotics Academy, it's in the National Box Engineering Center, which is actually off-site from CMU in an old mill town called Lawrenceville, which is now referred to as a hipster town. Okay, right. so basically NASA came and said, we're gonna give you this huge grant to build <laughs> that facility. So what you do at NREC, if you're a student, George, at CMU, and you have an idea for this robot, you go to NREC and you get funded to build one. So you build one robot. So let's say you had the idea that right. to create the room a robot's gonna run around and vacuum your house and do all that. You go and you build that one robot. Now, if you wanna mass produce that robot, if it's successful, you walk two blocks down the road and you go to Red Zone Robotics or you right. go to Carnegie Robotics. Now you can go to Uber. So basically all of these robotics, there's more robotic startups per capita in Pittsburgh than any other place in the world, oh. which was all started as a result of that. Obviously through things like the DARPA grant, that's where a lot of the autonomous vehicle technology comes from. Every day I see cars going up and down the road with the driver in the passenger seat with the big cameras on the hood and everything else like that. So in that sense, it's very inspiring to your point. But in addition to that, when you go to other places around the world, if you go to a place like Indonesia, in Indonesia, they'll go and they'll say, we have an oil-based economy. The price of oil does this. No one really knows why. We want to become more of a knowledge-based economy because we feel like that's what our students need in order to be able to succeed in the future. So in order to be a knowledge-based economy, we have to incorporate more of these STEM skills and specifically project-based problem-solving skills into our curriculum. And we feel like maybe robotics or something else is the best way to be able to do that. I've had that conversation in many places all over the world, whether it's in Barbados, if you're in South Korea, if you're in Indonesia, this is what it is that they're trying to do to essentially modernize their economy. Right. And they see as the means to do that is through education, beginning with students that are very young. I felt that I pulled out Jason, the history teacher there. <laughs> A little right? bit. I totally did. You're yeah. like giving us, throwing some history yeah. lessons. I love that. The, the Pittsburgh is like such, like when you talked about it, one of the things that I really appreciate is that they knew they had to 
like for the city to really become vibrant, to continuously develop, they actually had to shift some things, right? Yeah. And I think that's such a great lesson to do that as a city. Some people have to issues doing that as individuals, right? Yeah. And to do it as a city is a really compelling story. So you talk a lot about robotics and have you ever seen the robots for, I think it's, is it MIT? And they're like pretty lifelike and they're Boston a little Terminator. Yeah, Boston Dynamics has the different, the dog. Oh, and Boston yeah. Dynamics. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So should we be scared of this? Is this Terminator 2 happening? <laughs> yeah, like, what's yeah, going on there? Like, stuff, what, yeah. like how, how do you, is that, is that within your field? Is that in some of the work that you're doing? And is this a good thing or is this something we should be, people should be nervous about? So here's what I say, and I'll keep artificial intelligence on the side of it, but just, right. just, just focused on robotics. Here's what I say. If you think about, we don't know what the next big thing is going to be. If we did know, I would tell you, George, because we're friends now, and we'd have a right. bunch of money in that particular company and go buy an island somewhere. We don't know what it's going to be, but I'm fairly confident it's going to involve an embedded system. Software and hardware working together to deliver something to a user. Our phones are embedded systems. So we think about how ubiquitous embedded systems are in our life. When you talk about teaching robotics, all that you're really doing is you're talking about teaching students about the world around them. Just like you teach high school biology, you won't expect every student to go off and become a biologist, but you want to teach that to them because you feel like it's important for them to learn those things to live a very well-rounded life. And maybe one day in the future, when they're 30 or 40, they might want to become a biologist. Who knows? They have an opportunity to do that now. And that's really the view that we take with robotics in that, first of all, you're learning about the world around you. But second of all, you're learning about things like computer science and you're learning about all these authentic real world problems in the context that students actually come across them in the real world, oftentimes with an embedded system. So that's what we're really trying to do when you talk about the teaching of robotics. Now, some of our students, you mentioned the VEX robotics competition, some of the students are going to have big metal robots that can do a lot of really cool things. But at the end of the day, it's just understanding at a very fundamental level, how software and hardware can work together to produce the result that you want. I love that. That's, you didn't really answer if we should be scared, but I'll just- You pretend. should not be scared. There you okay. go. <laughs> right, okay. All right, just wanted, so you heard it here first, right? So yeah. when Terminator 2 happens, don't talk to me. That's Jason. I like how you just skipped over Terminator 1. You went straight to Terminator 2. Terminator 2 is a way better movie. Terminator 2 is an amazing movie. We'll disagree on that, but go ahead. Terminator 3, we can agree. Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> so I appreciate that because one of the things you said about the idea of biology, we've been having a lot of this conversation on the podcast is really, I don't think every kid should be good at science. I don't really believe that, but there's things within science that they should know when they walk out of there that are really important because we need kids who are good at science. We need kids who are good at math. We yeah. need kids who are great writers, great yeah. storytellers, right? Yep. So it's really helping kids find what they're good at, not having every kid good at the same thing when they walk out. And I think part of that too, is you made such a beautiful analysis of this is that idea that there are things in biology that they're going to see valuable, whether they become biologists or not. I think that is a conversation we need to have more and more in, in our communities. And just, I love how you put that too, because I, science was not, people listen to this podcast, science was not my thing, right? No, like scientific method is something I use often. In, yeah. in, in my life, in, in those connections. So your book is specifically, and I don't want to say targeted because it is, but it also, I know that there's benefits of this in, in all aspects, but you talk about this K to six and there would be some pushback. I remember, oh, that's going to sound weird. I had this conversation with someone I was interviewing and I said, well, how do you see the use of technology? This is for a grade two position. And they said, I don't think kids should be using technology at that young of an age. I said, why is that? Oh, it's bad, blah, blah, blah. I said, when do you think they should start it? And they're like, grade three. So I was like, okay, so just, so after you, right? Mm -hmm. So then I followed up with the question and I said, okay, so we actually might have a grade three position open. So if you were to get that job, how would you use technology? And it was like, basically don't, I don't want to touch this stuff. So I know that when we think of technology, I don't know if people are thinking robotics, but you have written this for a K6. So when you're talking about this from a K6 lens, what are some of the ways that, is there a strategy, something that you could give to people listening right now, maybe something from your book of how they could utilize this in that in the early elementary grades? Yeah, I'm gonna attack the question broadly and then at the end I'll sure. get specific for a specific thing because I think what you brought up is important. Education research is very clear. If a student is not reading at grade level at the end of grade three, they're probably never gonna catch up. And they refer to it as the Matthew effect. So as a result of that, K to two teachers especially are very, 
protective of their classroom time. My students have to learn their sight words, have to learn their multiplication facts, have to be able to do these types of things. So the pushback that you would get from them is, why am I worried about teaching computer science to a first grader? Why am I worried about introducing technology? And one of the things about it is if you think about something as simple as, first of all, asking the student, as all first grade teachers do, to unpack their backpack and put their books in their cubby and get ready to get their morning work. So they have to come to, they have to find their desk, they have to unpack their backpack, they have to take the right books out, they have to take their backpack, they have to go hang it up in the right place, then they have to return back to their seat and sort of think about the amount of working memory that needs in order for that to be able to happen. Think about the amount of spatial reasoning just to open the backpack and do those types of things, they should have to be able to do that. What do we know is the best way to foster skills like spatial reasoning skills and also increase students' working memory? By doing things like, for example, following instructions in order to be able to build something, whether you're building a Lego house or in our case, you're building something with a Vex Robotics, you're being able to do all those types of things. Secondarily, this idea of embodied cognition, I'm talk with my hands right now, not just because I'm Italian, but we know that movement and using your hands and doing those types of things is impacts literacy. When I taught in sixth grade, I had students that were sometimes pulled out. They were they had the neurodiverse students. They had learning difficulties. They were pulled out of my classroom by a physical therapist. And that's they did physical therapy with the students because they lacked the motor skills that were inhibiting their opportunity to do things like to read and write. How many times if you're a classroom teaches your student write on the paper on the desk and continue to write when the paper ends and they write on their desk? That's a lack of spatial reasoning skills. Mm -hmm. So when we treat these skills like reading sight words or multiplication facts and treat them within a particular bounded box, we're really doing our students a disservice. And oftentimes when those students that can't get out their morning work, hang up their backpack, go back and do it and sit down because they don't have the working memory skills, they don't have the special reading skills, those kids get labeled as troubled students or as bad students. It's very difficult for them to be able to escape that. So the thing that I tell business, we talk about high leverage solutions all the time. What is the smallest thing you can do to get the biggest impact? Well, introducing hands-on activities with your students, I believe is a very high leverage thing that you can do in your K-2 classroom in order to be able to increase things like their reading and their math and be able to do that in an effective way. If you're looking for specific ways to be able to do that, maybe introducing those hands-on activities, you're really not able to do that well. That's okay. If you're not comfortable doing that. Just share the stories of STEM in your classroom. Arguably the greatest scientific achievement of the 21st century is the picture of the black hole. It was done by a young woman, a researcher out of, I believe it was out of MIT. She did it with an algorithm. So talking about how computer science was, has enabled us to be able to do that and to get that scientific discovery and how that was able to happen. That is integrated STEM. That is science, technology, engineering, math, all working together to be able to give us this result. So if you're hesitant about giving up specific class time, if you don't want to introduce hands-on learning into a younger grade because of whatever reason, just using these STEM stories, and I go through and I highlight many of them in the book, just using these STEM stories, these STEM examples, using STEM books from your library and your elementary building to talk about these types of things for your students can be really impactful for them. Okay, there's two things I want to bring up. And I, Jason, I want to, Jason just did a little bit of a master class if you're in administration. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll tell you why, what I mean by that. One of the things I think is really when, so obviously you've had pushback to some of the stuff and you acknowledge the pushback. Yeah. And then you actually start from where the issue is to acknowledge that too. Because it, it's yeah, a big and, issue. Yeah. 100%, 100%. And I think a lot of times, we're basically doing these camps, right? So we have the basics camp and the innovation camp. So what you did is actually you connected the two. And there, there, is, there, there is a really great article. I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but it really affected me when I first read it. And it's like, if you're on a debate team, you actually have to know, and I use the term argument loosely. I know people understand what I'm talking. You actually have to make, be able to make the person's argument for them. If you really want to move people forward, you have to understand the other side's point of view. And maybe this isn't even an admin masterclass. This is a life masterclass. Cause I think a lot of our conversations that we're having, whether it's an education, whether it's political, People don't necessarily understand the pushback they're getting from people that have different opinions. So you have to understand that and then move backwards from there. So I thought that was, I love that you started from that point saying, like, Hey, here's the concern that we yeah. hear, have, and it's valid. 
It I is. think that's a really important aspect. The thing that I remember years ago when I wrote Innovator's Mindset, there is like this, I was really talking about innovation and people are like, back to basics, back to basics. And so I was like ignoring them. And then I was like, okay, what's the issue here? What is the issue here? So I started actually like reading into the basics camp. And I was like, I agree with all this stuff. Like I'm actually, people, people have this notion that kids shouldn't do times tables. Kids shouldn't know, do spelling tests. I'm like, no, I actually get my kids to do that stuff. I think it's really important. And I always give this analogy, right? If people say, you don't need to do spelling tests because we have spell check. I'm like, yeah, but you have to be in the vicinity of the word. Yeah. You can't just yeah. start slamming keys yeah. and things will work for you. So really, and I think this is what I really appreciate about your conversation. It's not about the basics or innovation. It's really the basics so that you can get to the innovation that you can actually go beyond what we could maybe do have potential for when I went to school. So I think that was like, that was a great solution, Jason. You crushed it on the podcast, man. I love it. It was good. <laughs> okay. So this is the last question I have for you. So we talked a little bit about what your book is about. What do you hope if people were to read this book, what do you hope is the big takeaway or the impact that it could have? on, I don't want to say in education, but on a teacher's classroom, because if it can help at least one person, yeah. what impact do would you see that helping not only the teacher, but more importantly, as always the student, what would that do for the students eventually? It, yeah, I think obviously getting teachers more, removing that impediment or that fear that teachers have and introducing new things into their classroom, specifically around STEM collaboration, problem solving, all of that. I think just removing just that fear of trying something new and going mm -hmm. through it. And by sh I share a lot of stories of myself and what I've done wrong in the classroom to try to, and again, I try to approach everything from a very humble perspective, just trying to eliminate the fear and the trepidation that a lot of teachers may have when it comes to being able to try things in their classroom. One of the great things about, about your book and a lot of the great things about what you talk about and do is the fact that schools are oftentimes not, they are not laboratories of innovation. You're not incentivized to try something new. You are not incentivized to go out and run an experiment and see what happens and then do a postmortem afterwards and say, this went well and this didn't go well and reflect upon those things. Teachers are oftentimes really not given the time to be able to do that. So I think just from an attitudinal perspective, just opening up your attitude and understand that there are things that you can try in your classroom. You don't have to do what I did. You don't do what other teachers are doing, but find something that you're comfortable with and then just try to get a little bit better every single day with it. I think then specifically though, in terms of from a knowledge perspective, the big takeaway that I want for teachers is one of the big things that I've learned researching for this book and preparing for this book. And I actually think I heard you mention this a podcast that I was watching earlier this week, with this idea that we all have these innate talents. Like I'm good at this and I'm bad at this. I'm poor at this, but I can be good at this. Just essentially erasing that mindset from ourselves as teachers and also from our students. Anders Ericsson wrote a great book called Peak that talks about this in his book and the fact that through calls it deliberative practice. It's famously where Malcolm Gladwell got his 10,000 hour rule, yeah. which Ericsson hates, by the way, he hates that term. But that's a lot of people hate it now. But the idea that students can't actually, and you as a teacher can't actually get better really at anything that you have the time and the patience to apply yourself towards. I always said when I was in the classroom, I was not the math guy. I didn't mm -hmm. like math. Let me write something. I'm better with words. Please don't ask me to do something mathematically. And really thinking about me passing on that attitude towards my students and students, of course, going to mimic the things that you say as a teacher. So really being able to eliminate that mindset, growth mindset, the work that Carol Dweck has done is fantastic. But I think Erickson actually takes it to another level talking about the fact that you really can, and the technical term for it, neuroplasticity, you can change your brain. You really can expand what it is that you're doing and not really pigeonholing yourself as being a math person or being a language person or for our students, someone that's not good at school, right? You can always be good at school. You can always be better. And for you as a teacher, you can always get better at teaching. So the book goes into a lot of the research behind that. Hopefully teachers can come away with that attitude that, that I came away with and then apply that to the classroom and apply that to their students. When you're talking about this, and I know you, you've you been in education, you're working currently in business and you yeah. are in the intersection of both. I was thinking about how basically every business has friction development. Yeah. Like R&D. Yep. And there's a certain amount of budget, time allocated to that. And as I was listening to you, I was thinking that's r really the key in education is that it's not, and I'm not talking about, we need a research and development department, even though there's obviously benefits to that too, 
I'm talking about every one of us has to make sure that we spend some time. What is that? Is it 15%, 20% of our time? And I'm just throwing numbers out there you know, where we actually committed to our own growth and development. I'm not talking about going to PD. I'm talking about like trying different things, getting uncomfortable. And sometimes we ask our kids to, to do things and be in ways that we don't necessarily act ourselves. Like we, we got what we're doing right now. We stuck in our ways a little bit. I, I'm guilty of this myself, sure. but we have to be constantly growing. We have to be constantly developing. And as you said, you know, innovators mindset is that kind of notion of going beyond growth mindset and actually taking the stuff that you learn and creating new ways of learning, creating new opportunities for yourself, creating new opportunities for your kids. I love that idea. You really sparked a lot of stuff in, in my thinking too. And I know a lot of people listen to it are going to love this. Jason, first of all, congratulations on the Thank book. You. Thank you. And I know that people are going to love it. Or I hope that if you're listening to this right now, and this is a published with is this Solution Tree Press. Solution yeah. Tree. Yeah, Solution Tree. So it's linked down below. Check it out. Uh, Jason, you're great. I really enjoy the conversation and I hope people appreciated this too. You can connect with Jason at McKenna J72 yep. on Twitter. On Twitter. Yep. Yeah. And so connect there too. Jason, all the best on the release of your book. And thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast today. Again, thank you for having me. This is really a pleasure. All right. Take care.